Good morning. Good morning, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. How many people are still drunk? <laughs> Good. Right. Um, cloud computing. This, this is really an introduction to the terminology that's used in cloud computing and hopefully a wake-up call for us to think about how we're going to be ready for it. How many people currently use cloud computing? So you've all got Gmail accounts and Dropbox and Flickr and all of that digital shite we look. Yeah? I hope at the end of this you will be slightly scared about what this is going to do for you professionally and how we as a profession react to it. So what this is really is a definition of terms and enough scare story to make you think carefully before you do something stupid that you'll react like in the paper. So, uh, the start off with some definitions. Uh, we'll look at what's called the five client tenants. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that's happened in commercial computing is that everybody now has cloud products. Everything is cloud. Uh, my box that has uh, disks in it, that's <coughs> cloud. Uh, this piece of software is cloud. Basically, if I can put it, a, an ethernet cable into it, it's cloud. And we call this cloud washing. So everything is cloud now, according to the manufacturers. So we're actually going to use something useful to tell us what cloud is, something to allow us to assess whether a product really is cloudy, and whether our way of doing things is cloudy. So that's what the five cloud tenants give us. We'll look at the way we use the cloud in the service models and the deployment models. So what are we trying to do and how are we going to deploy it? And then the key piece that most of us have got wrong so far, as a discipline we've got it wrong, is GRC, Governance, Risk and Compliance. And I'll talk you through that. And then we'll talk about the journey. And with a bit of luck, by the end time we get to the end of the journey, I expect somebody to shout bingo. Uh, <coughs> there's a lot of, lot of the buzzwords. One word, bingo, is it. Right. Uh, we'll look at the key issues and then I'll draw some conclusions which may or may not be contentious. So, the five cloud tenants are <coughs> rapid elasticity, measured service, broad network access, resource pooling, and on demand self service. I'll go through each of those in turn. Uh, and we'll look at the service models, SAS, PaaS, and IaaS. Uh, there's a lot of bad puns in there, I'm sure. Uh, and then the four deployment models private, public, hybrid, and community clouds. So, rapid elasticity is the ability to scale up the computing resource that's necessary to do a task and then scale it back down again when we finish or scale out and back in again. Scaling up is where you make the resource bigger, more grunt, and the scaling it back down is bringing it down again afterwards. Scaling out is where you divide the task, what we call sharding, shard the task out over many instances of a small computing resource, and when you finish, you shut down the ones that you know longer. So scaling out is relatively easy to do, um, scaling back in again is easy to shut down things down. Scaling up is nowadays pretty easy to do, but scaling back down again is bloody difficult. You nearly always have to do a reboot. You have to restart whatever the resource is in order to scale back down again. So typically, <coughs> scaling down is the problem. Scaling should be immediate, so it happens like that. We're talking you know, sub 30 second response to things happening. And you've got to work out how you're going to deal with your licensing. So many of the software manufacturers don't do licensing very well in these rapidly changing size environments. So Oracle is the classic case. If you like Oracle, great. You come to license it in a virtualized environment like this. I hope you've got deep pockets. Um, obviously, with open software, it becomes a lot easier because you can just have more and more free licenses. It doesn't really matter. Measured service. Here we say, how much of the service, whatever it is, are we using and so that we can pay for it? Because you're typically going to pay per use. So the more I use it, the more I pay for using it. Who has Gmail? 
Is it free? No, it's not free. You're not paying for it, but somebody else is paying for it. They're paying to put adverts in front of you. So somebody else pays. So the more you use it, the more adverts you see, the more Google get paid for your use of Gmail. So it's a pay-as-you-go model. Now, one of the things that's very popular about this is that we can take our cost of doing computing out of capital expenditure, where we have to go out and buy a big piece of tin to do something, and make it operational expenditure. The more I do, the more I use it, the more I pay, and it comes out of my flowing funds rather than buy something, let it decrease in value over however uh, many years until it breaks, throw it away, buy another one. Right? I'm just going to pay for what I use along the way. So it's very popular in business because it allows us to stop buying capital expenditure, and it works presumably well for archaeology. Um, to buying a room full of tin, to do stuff, we can rent it as we need it. Um, the way you consume it, how much it's going to cost, will depend on your contract, your, your contract with whoever's going to supply this to you. Now that might be the computing service within your own organisation that's going to charge you, but how you set up that relationship will affect how much you pay for it. And the more flexible you are, the more expensive it is. Flexibility means expensive. And it's just like mobile phones. If you sign up for a fixed contract of £40 a month, you get a lot more out of it than if you buy a small one and then top up. So the, the way you buy it will influence how much you pay for it. And, and we've already talked about the indirect payment. Broad network access is, I want to be able to consume this computing anywhere that is appropriate. Not anywhere, anywhere that is appropriate for the way I want to use that resource. So it doesn't have to be flood fill everything, you can do it anywhere. Uh, and we've got to be able to do it on whatever end point we want, whether that's a smartphone or a tablet or, or a <coughs> laptop. Okay. You're old fashioned. <laughs> so am I. Now, these definitions I'm using are the NIST definitions. Uh, as opposed to the definitions that are given by a particular manufacturer. Um, so at least there's some idea that it's a, a standard across the, uh, the organisations. Uh, resource pooling is I'm going to take a bunch of stuff together and then carve out of it just enough to do what I want to do. So I'm going to share the resources. So we've seen this a lot in virtualization software for PCs, so we're all familiar with products like VMware, Oracle Box, Zen. These are all hypervisor products which take a physical hardware box and allow us to slice it up and lie about the fact that we've got a whole bunch of PCs in it. So resource pooling allows me to say, on the simplest level, here's a bunch of resources, I'll slice them up as I want to. The critical thing for resource pooling is, is how you characterize a resource pool. Most resource pool characterization currently is done based on speeds and feeds. How sexy is it? How many gigahertz has it got? How much memory has it got? How big is it? How fast does it spin? This is increasingly seen as the wrong way of creating your resource pools. You should be creating resource pool characteristics based on what do they do for me as my business? What, what am I trying to achieve and therefore, I design a resource pool that achieves that. So I have to have some idea about how resilient I want this data set to be, how I want it to be delivered, and so on. And that allows me to characterize a set of resources which are capable of delivering this kind of computing to me in this place. So resource pooling, there's a lot to, more to be done in this area in order to make it really robust for our understanding of how to design our resource pool. Consuming. The other thing about the resource pool is there's going to be lots of other people using that resource pool. It's not just going to be yours. So you're going to be multi-tenant. So there's going to be a bunch of other people who you may or may not like, who may or may not be doing things legally. So there's already one classic case in the States where the FBI seized a disk array because somebody was doing something naughty on it. And they came in with a forklift and forklifted it out to the data center. Took it away for forensic analysis. There were a lot of other people who were on the same array. 
We have a couple of hundred terabytes of data on that, and the bad man only had a few hundred gig. All everybody else's data went out of the door with the FBI on their forklift. Ah. Can we survive that? Is that going to matter to us as archaeologists? If all of our data suddenly wanders off for a couple of weeks by the FBI? Possibly not. On demand self service. So I need some extra resource. I grab it. I grab it. I don't go and get somebody else to provision it for me. I go and get it myself. Um, this means that I don't need to work out when I'm going to need computing. It's always there. It's like electricity. It comes out of the wall, computing comes out of the wall. I just grab it when I want it. Um, forecasting is needed by the people who are going to supply me with that capability. Um, and that's kind of fun. They want lots of different types of people so that there's enough demand all the time that they can do it. And that's what people like AWS, Amazon Web Services are doing extremely well. They have container parks full of computing that they turn on as people use it. And then they turn it off again to save money. Um, so I am going to grab these resources when I need them, usually via some kind of portal. Right, cloud service models. Normally, people start at the bottom of this slide and work up and say infrastructure as a service is toys, platform as a service is toys with some software on it, and then software as a service is just the software being delivered to me. I like to think about it the other way around and say, what do I need to bring with me in order to use this service? So if I'm using software as a service, I have no visibility of where it's running and what it's doing. I just don't have its functionality. All I need to bring with me is my data. So this is Google Docs. A bunch of others. Platform as a service, I need to bring my data and my custom code, whatever it is that I want to run. So I'm going to get a platform that does stuff for me, which may or may not include the operating system. Well, it will include the operating system. When we go down to infrastructure as a service, I need to bring data, my custom code, and all the stuff I need to get that custom code running. So libraries, versions of software, all of that stuff I need to bring with me. In some places, that will include the operating system. So you just get infrastructure as a service, it's bare virtual tip. In other places, it will come with the operating system. And that is morphing greatly. So three years ago, if you went out and bought infrastructure as a service, you got a virtual box. And you had to put the OS on it and the software and your data and do stuff. Nowadays, what happens is you, most of the stuff's there. So you buy a LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. That's a standard infrastructure as a service offering. So the barrier or the differential between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service is moving up the stack constantly as, as suppliers find that it's easier and easier to provision higher and higher up the stack and that's where people want to consume. So most of you, what are you using? Software as a service, you're just using the software to do something. Yes? No? Who uses software as a service? That's Gmail, Google Docs, <coughs> All of that stuff. Anybody using platform as a service where you're buying in a capability of running some custom code of your own on a platform which you're renting? <coughs> okay. Anybody buying infrastructure as a service? Cool. Right. It's a, it's a, yeah. Most people, SaaS is what is cloud. That's what everybody thinks of as being cloud. And then once you get out of the, oh yeah, I'm, I'm using Google Docs, the other extreme is usually infrastructure. We're buying a plat something that we're going to run our stuff on. <coughs> so really what we need to think about is how we're going to deploy it. And there are four models. Private model is I'm going to do cloud, but I'm going to control the infrastructure that it runs on. So it's my toys, but I'm just going to use cloud as a way of delivering that to my consumers, my set of people who are going to use my resource. 
So I control it completely. And this has a lot of really nice things about it. I control it. The alternative is to go to public cloud, where you use a public service, AWS, Google, whoever. And then you have no control over the data. It's not in your hands. You don't own the infrastructure. You don't know where your data is. You cannot say, I know where my Gmail <coughs> account data is. You have no control over how it's backed up, how it's managed, where it lives, or anything. It's not allowed for you to have control of that. It's public. What most commercial organizations are going for is hybrid, where they mix private and public together to give them control of the things that they think they really need to have control of, and cheap resource for other things. What we're increasingly seeing now is the idea of a community cloud. So instead of using a completely public cloud, we have a group of organizations who share the same values, and they build the infrastructure and allow all of the partners to use it. Now, we're used to this in academic computing. All of the great computing stuff is effectively a community cloud. You go out and you borrow 30,000 CPU nodes from somebody who has grid stuff sat up for you to use. What's interesting is we're starting to see it in the commercial sector as well. So the New York Stock Exchange, for instance, now has a community platform because everybody knows how it needs to operate, and so they have a platform that everybody trusts and then you just grab a piece of it when you need it. I think that's going to be a very powerful model for cultural heritage, for archaeology. But we need to build, think about how we're going to build a community plan. Now this is the scary one. Governance, risk and compliance. This is the one we are, what's the technical term for it? Shit at. <laughs> so governance is, how do we control our data? And we're, so who gets to make decisions about it? What levels of risk are we willing to take as an organization with the data? So we're going to look at how we gather the data, how we look after it, how it lives in our organization, and how we dispose of it. That's good. Risk is how scary is it data? Generally, we have moderately scary, very scary, and bubble wrap. I'm so scared of this, I definitely don't want it to get damaged in any way. And then compliance is those rules that are placed upon us from outside. So it's like a subset of governance. Governance will always be we have to respect all of the laws and rules which apply to our data sets. We're not very good at that. How many people have their organization registered under the Data Protection Act? Mm, a couple. How many of you have the initials or names of your excavators on your con digitized content sheets? That's personal information. You should be registered under the DPA for that. If you think about putting that data onto a cloud service, because that's a cheap way of doing it, and you go to Amazon Web Services to provide that infrastructure for you, cheap, good quality, has all the stuff that you want, right. There's a tick box on the form when you go into AWS, which says something gibberish about Euro something or other, right? And it, by default, it's not ticked. Put your contact records on there, and you just broke the law. You're liable for five years in prison and a hundred thousand euro fine because you just let personal data leave the boundaries of the EU. You have to tick the box because it must stay in EU data centers if it has personal information on it. That kind of compliance stuff we don't know because we don't assess our data sets. Let's face it, we don't know what data sets we have. As a an entire population, we have no idea how much data we actually have. And we have not done a GRC analysis against those data sets to see how vulnerable we are. English Heritage did a work on 
how much data they held, and they said, oh, we'll have 30 or 40 data sets, but we'll, we'll do a catalog. They had 125. So that's 80 data sets that they didn't know about at a corporate level that they had never done a risk analysis on. And it happens that most of the 125 had the same data re-key, 125 sets of key mistakes in. Uh, the journey. Um, you start off by virtualizing, because that's cheap. Uh, then you knock out the silo walls. Uh, got silo in, that's on the plant group. Uh, to go to operationalize quality of service, and then you can start going to IT as a service to start to use the cloud. Now, these slides will be available with full notes underneath if you want to get out a bit more on this. So, what are the things that we need to know about? We don't know what data sets we hold as a discipline. We haven't done GRC analysis against those data sets. So we don't know the risk. We don't know what we've got. We don't know what the risk is. We have no rules for governing it. Therefore, we should never go to the cloud because we may inadvertently break the law, which is unlikely, uh, but we are very definitely going to expose our organizations to risk. Um, so where are we going to put the data in long term? There are very few long term repositories. Obviously, the ABS might be going to talk after me. Um, but we don't know what percentage of the data is actually deposited with a repository which understands how to maintain the data. An awful lot of our data sets are on floppy disks in a box in the museum, we think. <laughs> so we don't know what, what rules to apply to them. So what do we need to do? You go back and you make an inventory of every data set you own. Failure to do this is professional incompetence. You select the correct GRC regime for it. So you need to establish your GRC and then make the right choices about how to deploy based on the GRC and your data sets. So we need cultural heritage GRC now and a community cloud for shared computing platform in the future. Thank you.